And we are here in case number 17-4701, State of California versus Sessions. Council, please come forward and state your appearance. Good morning, Your Honor. Lee Sherman for the State of California, and my colleague Sarah Belton is with me as well. Great, good morning. Uh, August Flangey for the defendants, kind of pinch hitting today. Well, Mr. Flangey, it's a pleasure to see you. So I don't know whether uh, Mr. Sherman, Ms. Belton, you know, but Mr. Flunty and I were in the uh, civil division at the same time, and he actually succeeded me in uh, heading up the uh, Office of Immigration Litigation. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you uh, in the court. So I have questions. Why don't both of you come up, if you would, because I have a few questions. Um, and for, so starting with um, the facts, um, the, is it um, the department's plan to award uh, the Project Safe uh, Neighborhood grants to benefit the judicial districts in California for enforcement of federal firearms laws, just not uh, to the state of California as a fiscal agent? Uh, yes. The, the, I mean, the, we have promised, uh, and I think in the last hearing, promised to hold off on selecting a fiscal interme intermediary to allow, uh, allow this proceeding to kind of move forward quickly. We're anxious to get that done. Uh, there, there's definitely a plan. I mean, California will be getting Project Safe Neighborhoods funding. It's, the question is, will California be the fiscal intermediary or will they find a, a nonprofit? Okay. And uh, are you authorized uh, to represent that the department's decision is not based on California's refusal uh, to comply with the department's interpretation of 1373? I can I can assure the court that in making the decision hasn't been made, so there will be would be a decision made on fiscal intermediary, and I can assure the court that in making that decision, uh, DOJ would would not base it on the independent statutory obligation of Section 1373. And I'll. You know, as an example, if, if California were selected, we wouldn't make them sign that form that's come with a lot of these grants. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, you know, the Project Safe Neighborhood Program is a, a, a broad kind of discretionary grant. It includes some pretty broad language on, on the government's authority to, to issue the funds. Uh, and it is possible that the department will expect that the fiscal intermedi intermediary, if it is you know, a governmental unit in California would kind of cooperate in sort of the way Congress expected in Section 1373, even if not relying on that statute as an independent source of authority. And we read... The way that Congress expected as opposed to the way that the court interpreted it? Is that what you're saying? No, well, what I, I guess what I'm saying is uh, we think that there's discretion to manage that money very flexibly in the Project Safe Neighborhoods grant. And, uh, and under that discretion, uh, the, the Attorney General could say, well, we want the kind of cooperation that you kind of see described in 1373, just not the, we're not going to apply that law, but we want that kind of cooperation from our partners. And, and again, uh, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves because there actu actually has not been a decision on who the fiscal intermediary would be, and we, uh, if there were a decision, there would be sort of uh, an explanation, I think, for not picking California or for picking California, and it would kind of bring to light maybe some of this, but I can assure the court that in reaching that decision, there will be no reliance on the independent statutory obligations of Section 1373 under the, because of this court's order in, in, in our affairs with California. So I guess I had missed um, that other fact uh, that the department hasn't made a determination one way or another uh, on uh, who the fiscal agent would be. Yeah, it's a little confusing. I mean, the California pressed us hard for some explanation as to why things weren't moving forward in October. And, you know, I'll tell the court, they, we were struggling with how this court's orders were still, we're still litigating over exactly what they were going to say and how they would apply and what sort of authority that the government would still have under in handling the PSN program. So that's sort of been on hold while this has been going on. Uh, I think in sort of communications with California, we explained some reasons why this court's order doesn't mandate that we select California under the PSN program, but that shouldn't, that was, you know, an email from Mr. Simpson to, to, to lawyers for California. So that shouldn't be interpreted as an agency decision that's under review. Uh, 
uh, if the, and then we agreed to hold off in making that decision until this proceeding concluded. Now, you know, I think people are antsy to make that decision and, you know, if they want to challenge it, it, it would pro and especially on the sort of the administrative grounds that they kind of talk about a lot in their brief, there's some sort of nefarious administrative process and, and the process has problems. Th certainly that would have to wait till an, there's actually an administrative decision to evaluate rather than sort of kind of speculating what people might be thinking in, in, in moving forward. So, Mr. Sharman, sure. the, let's suppose uh, that the basis that, that the department um, either has made or is, as Mr. Flunge says, about to make uh, a, a decision with respect to um, uh, the fiscal agent. And let's suppose that their determination rests on uh, the fact that the, ca that the state has been uh, resisting numerous policies of this administration, uh, including but not limited to the way that it interprets 1373. And so it doesn't think that California is a good partner um, to proceed. And let's assume that that has not a lot to do with the purpose of this grant, which is enforcement of federal firearms laws. With that understanding, uh, there is still the fact that the Project Safe Neighborhoods isn't involved in, hasn't been involved in the litigation that we've just concluded. Um, and it's a different kind of a grant. Uh, it's a discretionary uh, grant with, I think, broad discretion given to the department uh, just in light of its history and uh, the lack of legislative guidance. Um, and I don't think the language in the solicitation changes that. Um, I think it, there's language there that allows the department uh, wriggle room. So um, if there was direct evidence of what the, d that the department um, was um, making its determination when it does make its determination um, uh, that it's it based on Californians non-compliance with the department's interpretation of 1373 maybe in a separate lawsuit or an administrative proceeding or through FOIA requests or something that evidence can be developed but I just don't see the direct evidence I understand the inferences that you'd like me to draw I th they're not unreasonable uh, inferences, but given the distinction between what this case, uh, w between the amended judgment and uh, Project Safe Neighborhoods and the lack of that direct link, I'm, uh, I'm skeptical on whether I'm uh, going to grant your motion. So sure. take that on. Sure. I appreciate that, Your Honor. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, California's position is both in connection with the solicitation and the statute itself, 41504, is that it is mandatory for um, for the department to issue Project Safe Neighborhoods funds to each judicial district. And it's but and uh, that just to me the the statute I I understand where the statutory argument comes from, but the history of of this grant seems to argue against that, doesn't it? California would disagree with that. That from 2003 to 2011, and the statute was 41504, uh, what is now 41504 was enacted in 2000, November 2002. Starting in 2003, as the declaration from Tracy Troutman shows, Project Safe Neighborhoods was implemented as a formula grant for from that time until 2011. Then in 2012, it, it was turned into a competitive grant. And every year from 2012 to 2017, California received PSN funds. So it has not, did not need to challenge whether it was competitive or, 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 um, or, or mandatory because, because it received its, uh, its funds. So this is the first year since P the statute was enacted that California has not received its funds. But if, if California is going to receive, if the state may not receive the funds, but uh, what I just understood from Mr. Flunge, and it was something that I was very concerned about, uh, if the substantively this money is going to come to the district, the uh, judicial districts uh, in the state, and it's just that the state's not the fiscal agent, 
I'm not, I'm not po I, I understand why the state would be concerned, uh, but, uh, but the purpose of the grant would seem to be fulfilled and the people of the state of California will be getting uh, the benefits of, of the funding. So this is, so the, what um, Mr. Fuente represented is news to California because in the email correspondence that Mr. Simpson sent to California, he did not say that a different fiscal agent would be chosen. He said simply that California was not getting these funds. Okay. So this, so this, is, this is new. But in and it's good. Yes. <laughs> well, in any event, though, the solicitation, th this, this raises the concern that they are deviating from the solicitation because the solicitation had a process in which the fiscal agent is, is chosen and certified by the U.S. Attorney's Office by the application deadline, which was done here. And the California Office of Emergency Services applied for four judicial districts. There was one judicial district, the Eastern District, in which the, uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance contacted OES and said that actually by the application deadline, they had chosen a different fiscal agent. So your application for the Eastern District is denied. And California is not asking for, those, for the funds for the Eastern District. But for the other three, to now post hoc choose a different fiscal agent to try to take these funds away from California is, seems to be an end round, both around the court's judgment and around the solicitation, which, which had a very specific process for how this is supposed to go. Okay, um, so uh, is there anything else that, um, that you want to argue with respect to, um, uh, to the motion? I mean, I just, I, I see this as a, um, uh, a distinct, I mean, it's certainly a distinct grant, sure. uh, it's a distinct program. Uh, and, uh, and there are questions about both uh, the timing and then the relationship and the lack of evidence. And, and so all of those things I'm concerned about. And if you wanted to, uh, to take on any of those, um, uh, feel free. <laughs> sure, Your Honor. So just a, just a few things. So um, starting with the, I think this could be resolved both by, the, both by the solicitation and by the statute. So the solicitation, the only pre-award criteria that, it, that the solicitation places on California uh, or, or any fiscal agent is this requirement to comply in 1373. That is the only thing that is in dispute. And here, the fact that now there is all of this after the fact, if, if fact actions that are happening, they're deviating from the solicitation is exactly what the DC Circuit and Robbins and in Mass Fair Share warned against, that this is a danger signal that the agency is acting contrary to the announcements that they directed to potential applicants. And just because and they, they may disagree and they may appeal the judgment, which was not, which was broad, in which they're in our in the motion to amend judgment. This was about 1373 and whether defendants can require compliance with it as a condition for any grant, not just Jack. So, so now that they are unhappy about that, they are now they are now taking these after the fact actions to deviate from the solicitation which binds them. And this, in mass fair share, which we cite on page three of our reply brief, is exactly on point there, in which the agency was acting contrary to the notice of funding opportunities and the manuals, the agent, the non-regulatory agency guidance that was out there, and, and denying an application on a basis other than the one that was announced. And that is what is happening with respect to, to this grant. So we would, so California first thinks that this can be resolved on the, on the solicitation. Second of all, as to the statute, we, the, the, Cal, the, the statute is clear that 41504 directs the, the Attorney General to issue funds to each judicial district and for the purpose of identification and prosecution of firearms. And that is a mandate that binds the, the, the agency. And uh, with- it, and it says that, that the Attorney General shall establish a program for each United States attorney to provide, mm -hmm. which is what they did in 2002. Mm -hmm. Well, this goes to the question of whether the statute has a degree of permanence, and California would argue that it is, that the subsection A established it is like an enabling provision. But then they had these um, five years where the Obama administration um, gave 
grants to just 14 of the districts instead of 94. Right. Um, and you're just saying that that was an illegal um, uh, determination by the department, I guess. Yeah, that is Calif the California's position that as, and, and California did not have to litigate that. But with respect to, but, and also with respect to looking at subsection B, what, what's important to, uh, clarification to make is that the a presumption against permanence applies to appropriation acts. This is an, as defendant's brief on page nine acknowledges, this is an authoriz authorization for appropriations, which the GAO principles on page 54 distinguishes from an appropriation act. So there is no presumption against permanence here, and indeed the statute would not make any sense if it was only to apply for just that fiscal year and not to apply after that, because for the very fact that subsection B authorizes the hiring of new U.S. attorneys for each judicial district. And this was, it was a legislation that was approved in November of 2002 after the fiscal year had already ended. So it wouldn't make any sense for that provision to only apply to fiscal year 2002 to hire new U.S. attorneys to, uh, to implement a program just for a fiscal year that had already passed. So we think both on the terms of the solicitation and on the terms of what is now 41504 that this is a mandatory grant that um, it can, that any and it's a block grant, so any conditions on it should only be limited to the purposes of the stated purpose in the statute. And that this is not, so, so this, the 1373 or their post hoc rational, rationalization for withholding funding is not a permissible purpose. And that now this ap after the fact action that deviates from the solicitation in order to get around the court's judgment should not be allowed. All right, Mr. Flanke. Uh, I'll just make a couple points. First on 41504, you know, if that statute, uh, we're not saying it's not permanent. That's a part of the U.S. Code. It's still there, uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's, it has continuing existence. But that statute is an authorization to hire AUSAs. So if that statute applies to this grant, the only thing the money could be spent on is hiring AUSAs. That is what that statute is about. So while that statute applies, the Project Safe na Neighborhood f grant money has always been authorized separately and it, in a separate appropriation that does not reference that statute. It has not referenced it ever. It doesn't reference it this year. And the solicitation doesn't reference that statute for this year. So it would be very strange to apply that statute, which authorizes hiring U.S. attorneys to say uh, California is entitled to a block grant. The second piece I'd say is they've, they've talked about, well, from 2003 to 2011, it was a uh, formula. The, there's an important thing that changed in 2012. It's that the, it's that the appropriations language changed. They, Congress added the word competitive to the appropriations authority, which is, if there's no, which makes very clear that you're not going to be awarding to every single applicant. Competitive, that's what that means. And that is the language that started in 2012 went through when there were like leaner funds, I think, for the program, so there were only a few grants. Now, I think the new administration is trying to revitalize the program and give grants to as many districts as possible. In fiscal year 2018, it still uses that competitive language, so that is still the governing principle. And I'd also know, you, you talked about gun crime. The, the, the grant is for gun crime and gang violence, and I just want to give an example of the sort of factors that might be relevant. Gang violence. One thing that California enacted recently is something called AB90. It refuses to share their gang database with immigrate with DHS. I don't know if that's going to play a role, but it's totally different from the th kinds of things we fought about in these hearings up to now. And it it's highly relevant to what the Project Safe Neighborhood Grant is all about. Uh, on the solicitation, they talk about well, you have to follow the solicitation. We totally agree. And mass fair share, and there's Supreme Court cases that say the same thing. If an agency has a policy, agency has to follow that policy. Can't just throw it out the window without telling anyone. We totally agree with that. The solicitation speaks to principles, five key principles. They've been around for a while. One of them is partnership. One of them is prevention. Both of these principles are the th sorts of things that would be weighed if there were an administrative process. And the last thing I'd say is to the extent they're fighting, they're concerned about uh, making sure we apply the solicitation properly. That is, I know we've had reasons to jump the gun in some of these cases against the government's arguments and sort of, well, there's now been a condition issued. That's a final decision. If you're asking about how these 
solicitation factors are going to be applied when considering California's request, you really, there, there's really nothing to do until there's an actual agency decision saying, sorry, California. Uh, and I guess one other thing I just raised for the court's awareness on like, will California get the money? There are other jurisdictions that have had con where uh, nonprofit fiscal agents have been found because uh, states or governments were concerned about 1373. So uh, your order doesn't apply in those other jurisdictions, but you know, th they've gotten money. Those jurisdictions have gotten money through the U.S. Attorney's Office with a nonprofit fiscal agent. All right. So, um, do you have sure? One just more a, thing just to a, say? just a few okay. things. Um, s oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, so, on page fifty-five of the GAO principles, it says that there is no general requirement, either constitutional or statutory, that an appropriation act be preceded by a specific authorization act. The existence of a statute, organic legislation, imposing substantive functions upon an agency is itself sufficient authorization for the necessary appropriations. So the fact that there is not an authorization um, beyond 2002 that specifically identifies PSN does not matter. That, that according to GAO's principles, the agency can use a lump sum appropriation that does not specify PSN towards PSN, but the moment that the agency uh, uses those funds towards PSN, it has to follow the enabling a, a, a statute. So I want to make that point cl um, clear. And in, in Lincoln, uh, which defendants rely upon, stands for that, 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 that e even if they can use a lump sum appropriation, that they have to still follow their statutory mandate. Uh, Mr. Fuente referred to AB 90 and saying that that restricts um, sharing of information to federal law enforcement. That is false. And this came up in U.S. v. California. There's a declaration from Joe Dominic that addresses this po point, who is the, uh, dr uh, the chief of our uh, CJIS uh, division in the California Department of Justice, which disproves that point. And as the record that we've put forward for you shows, California partners with federal law enforcement including Homeland Security investigations on a number of different matters, including on firearms trafficking, drug trafficking, and in taking down MS-13. And the record shows that, and defendants have not put forth one ounce of evidence to suggest otherwise. And then, and finally, with respect to the competitive process, that is, the solicitation makes clear that that competitive process is for the sub-grantee selection. Um, so it, it, is a, it would be a competitive process the same way that JAG is a competitive process, in which once the state entity that receives JAG funds gets the award, then they issue a request for proposals into the field to select subgrants to, to fit the purposes that JAG is intended to fund. But that competitive process does not apply to the selection of the fiscal agent, which happened before uh, which, which happened by the application deadline is, and, and according to the solicitation is what should be followed. All right, so um, uh, here's, here's what I think. Uh, I think that uh, the issues that um, you're raising with respect to PSM may, um, uh, uh, may be raised in a separate action if it's um, uh, something that the state um, thinks ought to be pursued. Uh, I don't at the moment see the, uh, I understand what the, what the state thinks the link is to uh, the, uh, the case that I've entered the amount of judgment on, but I, uh, I don't think the evidence is there right now. I also think it may not be ripe at the moment given Mr. Flungey's um, statement with respect to the uh, determination. Uh, so that's, that's sort of step one. Step two, I don't know whether uh, the state will decide it's a useful uh, thing to go after if in fact uh, the department is going to be um, awarding these funds to the judicial districts and just using a, a different fiscal agent. I'm, I'm not sure where the there's probably standing somewhere to challenge that um, based on the 10% administrative fee. But, but I think you would need to think pretty carefully about that. Um, I do 
um, Mr. Fungi, see the um, connection that is uh, that the state uh, has inferred uh, with respect to what the department may be thinking about and the litigation that's gone on before. So I suspect that if the state did file uh, an action, it would, would be related to the cases that uh, that I've seen uh, already, and uh, and so um, that's sort of where where I see all of this. Um, with that, I think I will wish you all a very uh, happy holiday, uh, and um, thank you for your argument. Thank, thank you, Your, your Honor. Honor. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs>